The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind, the Tathagata. Today is the sixth day of this seven-day session, second in a row, here in April 2022, the first being March, April, and now this one in April. Just a few days difference uh, between the two sessions, which allows us a refresher and a chance to dive deeper through activity and to keep that deepening going through the second session. It is a tremendous way to, to do spiritual practice for those who are able to take the time off, whether by Zoom or in person. And I'd like to continue sharing today with you something of, of Rumi, Jilalurin Rumi, who was a, a 13th century mystic in the Islamic tradition, the Sufi. And um, as was said several days ago, he is bracketed by uh, St. Francis of Assisi and Meister Eckhart to Christian mystics. We here in the Sashin, whether we know it or not, are reaching deeply into our own mystical sense because all the people throughout the ages, and there are millions of them really, of all manner of religions, who, and some without any religion, who have had mystical experiences deep enough to transform their lives. This is what we're working towards in Zen as well. There is a deep truth that is true regardless of whatever religion you happen to have been born into or adopted. And even as I said, whether or not you have a religion because it's built into us. It is the nature of being. And Rumi catches this essence very well. There are, um, if you talk about um, the nature of mind, there are multiple aspects, two in particular, form and emptiness. And this has different, different uh, names in different religions. Uh, I think it is called Makan Fana in, the, in, in uh, Rumi's way of speaking. I think that is in the Persian. One is to be, to experience emptiness, uh, but emptiness is not just emptiness. It's to be uh, consumed by, uh, one doesn't have a name for it really. And really it's returning to what we came out of his birth. <coughs> and the other is, uh, of course, we're, we're sitting here uh, talking from a body, a physical body, surrounded by uh, walls and other physical bodies and trees and plants and and all there is. But if we make the mistake of taking what we can see and hear and think as the truth, we're missing half of it, a vital half of it. And Rumi points to this, many, many writings, spiritual writings, uh, the chants, some of the chants that we do in, in Zen uh, point to this, uh, this multiple aspect of beingness. This form is emptiness and emptiness is form at the same time. And I'd like to share a little bit of, more of Rumi because as I said, he, he points to this eloquently through a metaphor And we'll try 
for the first time to do this on the Kindle, the iPad. <clears throat> I belong to the beloved, have seen the two worlds as one, and that one call to and know, first, last, outer, inner, only that breath, breathing human being. I belong to the beloved, have seen the two worlds as one, and that one call to and know first, last, outer, inner, only that breath, breathing human being. The deeper we go into our Zazen, the more that rings absolute truth to us. And uh, I was talking about Fana and Baka, Bak I think it is called. Um, and in Coleman Barks, who is the translator of this book that I'm reading from, which is called The Soul of Rumi, and is a long time, 25 years, translator of Rumi, and a deeply spiritual person himself, which one has to be if one is translating from a spiritual master. And he says, uh, he defines Fana as annihilation in Allah. Annihilation in Allah. That is from the Islamic point of view. Annihilation is the same as awakening in Zen. In order to come to awakening, we have to forget, let go at least momentarily, who we think we are. Let go that that uh, mask that we put forth in society. That assumption that uh, who we think we are is who we really are. And let go into what we came forth from. As the scroll behind me says, out of not one thing arise the 10,000 things. And we return to that not one thing as we die. And then emerge again. And through our Zen, Zen practice, uh, when we go deeply into samadhi, again, we dissolve into the not, that not one thing, into annihilation in Allah, into annihilation in God. Whatever we want to call it is not so relevant as that it should happen to us because it is liberating. We fundamentally experience the roots of our being and through that are, are liberated to one direction, uh, one degree or another, depending on how deep that experience is from our persona. Now, we can be worried, and there is concern uh, before we have that experience, that um, who we think we are is going to disappear and never come back and we'll be a blithering idiot. We'll just wander naked through the streets or whatever, like actually one neighbor did when we were living in Cleveland Heights, but she was schizophrenic. That was a very different situation. We don't wander naked through the streets. Rather, we live more completely and fully than we did when we were operating out of an idea of who we were. We have a sense of this, otherwise we wouldn't sit here for six days and looking into seven days of doing this, we wouldn't come again and again to this. We wouldn't go to the mosque, we wouldn't go to the church, we wouldn't go to uh, the forest and meditate we wouldn't sink inward, lying down in the grass as I did when I was in high school, searching for something beyond the pain and suffering I was experiencing. It is here, now, nowhere else. But we have to let go who we think we are in order to find it. Didn't Descartes nail it when he said, I think, therefore I am? 
I think, therefore, I feel like I exist. But existence happens well before we have the capacity to think. Small children being born have the ability to comprehend, but not to think. The brain comes online in a, in a level where we can actually come up with actual thought uh, much later, somewhere around 15 months. And then we begin to uh, communicate through language. But before that, we, we have everything we need to survive in the sense of infancy. We can eat, we can sleep, we can poop, we can pee, we can cry when we are uncomfortable, and hopefully someone will come and respond in a loving way to that. Baka brings the next stage in the process of prayer. There's the opening into annihilation, which precedes awakening, actually, and involves awakening. Then the coming back to ten specific people. A melody, the little German band coming up through Beethoven's Ninth. This is the ocean come to court the drop. Rumi speaks a lot of, of the ocean and, and the drop. The ocean of existence, the ocean of being, the drop of uh, selfness. But the drop becomes the ocean, and out of the ocean comes the drop. We return to not one thing. And if we're fortunate, we open to not one thing while we are still alive in this body. And this is why bodies are so important. Uh, when the Buddha was searching for the answer to his deep questions, why? Why? Why is there suffering? Why do we get born if we're just going to get sick and die? And first he tried to find the answers through self-mortification, which was the prevailing religion of the time. And then he realized that he needed this body to find his answers. And so he chose to go the middle path. He'd already been the path of extremity, uh, through his birth into uh, what was uh, probably the highest level of um, human existence. Uh, everything he wanted could be provided. And of course, this was way before anything we have uh, offered to us now. It doesn't matter. The same is true of us. And then he finally found the middle way, which was sinking within letting go, letting go, letting go. Every breath that we breathe out, every breath that we extend in particular, particularly if it is, it is uh, accompanied by this yearning to be free, brings us closer to this return, to that which we've never left, really. Why do it? We're drawn to do it. Being born, taking birth, is because we're drawn to life. We're drawn to comprehend this mystery in person, not through thought, not through ideas, but to experience the liberation that it provides more from Rumi. Actually, this is more from Coleman Barks. By letting go these two conditions, Fana and Baka, flow and exist simultaneously in his poetry. Rumi is saying that they're one thing, the core of a true human being, which he was and out of which these poems are spoken. This is how alive his model of the human psyche is, where the secular and the sacred are always mingling, the mythic and the ordinary 
dream vision, and street life. This is quite understandable from the point of Zen. The universe and the light of the stars come through me. I am the crescent moon put up over the gate to the festival. That is one of his poems. Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. Oneness with all life. The universe and the light of the stars come through me. Except when that happens, there's no me to come through. We experience it, but the me idea is not there for that experience. And then the me idea comes back, and I am the crescent moon put up over the gate to the festival or the flag flying in front of the temple, uh, announcing a talk. And then a little bit more from Coleman Barks. Rumi tells of Solomon's practice of building each dawn a place made of intention and compassion and sobet which is mystical conversation. He calls it the far mosque. Solomon goes there to listen to the plants, the new ones that come up each morning. They tell him of their medicinal qualities, their potential for health, and also the dangers of poisoning. I suggest we all get green shawls. Remember, the entrance door to the sanctuary is inside you. That part, that last sentence is roomy. Mary's hiding place and the great warehouse and other images of the listening tent where conversation thrives and love deepens. The story of the green shawl is that Coleman Barks happened to be sitting in meditation in the tomb uh, of Mevlana, of uh, Rumi, in Konya one day. He was sitting, sitting deep in meditation and somebody came and, and draped him in a green shawl and he writes that he still has that green shawl. As we sit on our cushion, we enter our own temple, whatever you want to call it, a mosque, a church, the forest, the great self. With our intention to open to the truth, and as we continue that with our various means to do so, and here in this Zendo, it's the extended out breath coupled with the yearning. Gradually we enter that not one thing. And we do it again and again, and each time we go deeper. And of course there are rough places Sometimes we get frightened, particularly early, early on. And sometimes we find ourselves having difficulty just sitting down and being quiet. Um, sometimes we get bored. Sometimes we get irritated. And then sometimes we just simply dissolve into the meditation. The reason it's called Zen practice is because it requires practice. Whatever you're about, whether it is meditation, uh, whether it is entering prayer in a religion, practice is required. And then what can be known as spontaneous awakening can come. But it's spontaneous only in the sense that suddenly it appears, but it appears in response to an emptying out that is essential before we can drop into that knowing with a capital A K. So here is a, a poem called Work in the Invisible. The prophets have wondered to themselves, how long should we keep pounding this cold iron? This is one I 
tried to read yesterday without being able to read it. How long do we have to whisper into an empty cage? Every motion of created being comes from the creator. But the creator is not something outside of ourselves. Many, many spiritual paths point to this. Sometimes they get ossified and turn into dogmatic so-called teachings, which come out of the mouths of people that haven't been there and experienced it. But the core is always true and universal. This human body has the potential to awaken to a truth that is profoundly transformative. The mystics through the centuries, regardless of whatever path they took, experienced that. We can as well. For more than 2,500 years, since the Buddha himself experienced this deep awakening, countless human beings have also had that experience. And of course, when we say that experience, it's unique to each person. But the profound truth of it is the same. And in the sixth day of Sashin, we are closer than ever to uncovering it, to opening to it. It is within us. So the deeper we can go, and don't get any ideas about that, just keep tuning into the yearning. Just keep reaching through the breath. Just keep daring to let go with self-conscious awareness and become the ocean. Thank you for listening. We'll stop now and recite the four vows.